Grand since I have a captive audience, you get to see my travel slides. So these are the Grand Tetons. If you've not been up to the Tetons in the Yellowstone, it's only like four and a half hours from there. It's beautiful. So get up there if you can. It's very, very nice. So they're not in the winter. It's very cold. Oh, let's see. Am I not? So the fun thing is that the um, Snake River runs right underneath the Tetons and then goes through a canyon in Idaho where the rapids are. So there's no rapids on this stretch of the Tetons, but if you want to see the mountains, it's a really nice way to go. So as you come along, as you can see, it's very placid, and so you just sit in the boat and take lots of pictures, which is nice. But the thing I like about it is each corner you come around the river, there's just a new view of the mountains. They're just right up there, just, just sticking up out of the river, so it's quite spectacular. And, you know, some places people are actually out fishing, you see some moose, you know, you see deer and elk, and you see all kinds of, all kinds of, uh, of wildlife along here. Here's our boat with our intrepid guy on it. As you can see, this isn't exactly whitewater rafting. I mean, people are just sitting there. You could have a TV in there if you wanted. So. But it is, it is pretty as you go through there. And there's your intrepid rafter there. I mean, they don't even give you a paddle. They don't even give you the illusion that you're on the rapids. So you basically <laughs> just sit there and it just passively goes down. But you, know, you, can't, you just can't miss having beautiful scenery like that right behind you as you come around every corner. Okay, we're going to talk about the orbit today. Chris, tell us kind of how we divide the orbit into the main areas. What are the parts of the orbit? So we've got this cadaver I've seen in kind of an MRI view. Yeah, so intraconal, extraconal. Okay. Intraconal, and how do we define the difference between intraconal and extraconal? The muscles. So what's inside the rectus muscles and what's outside? Basically. Exactly. And so you see the rectus muscles as they insert, they come back to the apex and they form a cone. And there's an intramuscular septum around the rectus muscles. And so that really does tend to make a distinguishing, not a barrier, but just a distinguishing area between the intraconal and the extraconal. So there is definitely an intramuscular septum here that divides it off. And what's the most important things that run through the intraconal space? Uh, the optic nerve. Exactly. So the optic nerve, but also a lot of the blood vessels. Right. A lot of the blood vessels and the nerves running that. What's any, what, what goes into the extraconal space? Uh, there's a lot of fat. Um, yeah. So not a, lot of, not a lot of anything. Some fat, some small blood vessels, not a whole lot of anything. What's the third potential space in the orbit? Third potential space. Uh, I'm trying to think of Depending on what textbook you use, they'll often talk about a third potential space, and that's the subperiosteal space. Okay. And so periosteum is what lines the bones of the orbit. And so when you get an abscess, especially something arising from the sinuses, you can see the sinuses are right. They're medial to the orbit, they're inferior, they're superior. The only place you don't have sinuses is, is temporally here. And so you do have a potential space in the, in the subperiosteal space. So people will often call that a potential space. All right, so now we're looking at the orbit in a more of a sagittal type view. So here's the bone, globe, lids. You can see muscle. And then in the intraconal space, here's the optic nerve, a lot of vessels, and then the muscles here in the extraconal space, not a whole lot exciting going on there. And you can see it again in a, in a scan, just shows you the relationship of the um, sinuses adjacent to the orbit. So a lot of diseases that affect the sinuses can spill over into the orbit, including infectious, including inflammatory, and including neoplastic. And so you always want to keep that in mind when you're talking about the orbit. So not only can things that live in the orbit cause primary problems, but the tissue around it, especially the sinuses, can cause problems. All right, Becca, what are we looking at here? It 
it is the lack of a black. It's a good thing because <laughs> because I would have cried here if you got that wrong. And so when you look at these, it's glandular, and you see it's got this pattern we call acinar. And acinar means you make an ass of your if you get this wrong. So it's acinar. So you can see it's got these round cells with the nuclei um, around the edge, and then you've got these little kind of reddish pink granules in the middle, and then they dump into this little tiny acinine. And eventually all those gather up, and then it dumps it in ducts. So this is a classic eccrine gland. And so these are sweat glands, and these are also lacrimal glands. So this is what the lacrimal gland looks like. So we're going to talk a little bit about potential things that can affect the lacrimal gland. So, Tara, what do we see in here? You know, orbit is one of the hardest things because unlike the rest of the eye, this is the one place you can't see what's going on. So you have to try to infer. So when you see pictures like this, you try to look and you say, what's different about those two eyes? Is there a symmetry? Is there something different? And if you look over here, there's a very subtle fullness here. And you see that that eye looks like it's pushed down just a little bit more compared to this eye. So very subtle. And the problem is, is if you're going to look at an orbit, you need to look at it with scans because you can't really see it. So what do we see in here on this CT scan? Um, it looks like there's uh, like kind of a circular pattern going down the lateral mass of the orbit. Okay, so people call that a coin-shaped, coin-shaped mass. What would you be concerned about there? Um, that could be the lacrimal glands. All right, does dacryoadenitis adenitis give you a nice, discrete cone or coin shaped lesion? No. Yeah, and that's the key thing. So, dacryoadenitis or lymphoid infiltrates give you more diffuse. And, and um, you know, when we do an orbit conference, when Chris shows you those scans, he likes to talk about like it's like putty and it goes around things. Now, this is a coin lesion. It's almost like there's a distinct, you know, um, quality around that. What would that be concerning for? Neoplasia. Okay, so you'd be concerned about a possible neoplasia. So when we look at this, this is a, um, this is that particular patient. Well, it's not, but let's say it is. What do we see in here? Um, I mean, it looks like there's lots of small blue cells. All right, and if you look at them, they're kind of in a pattern. And so you've got a proliferation of these little cells here. They almost look like they're glandular. And then in between them, in between these kind of little glandular looking cells, you've got this kind of this connective tissue and spindly shaped looking cells. What, what kind of tumor looks like this? Is this malt? The malt by definition is lymphoid. And I'm not seeing a whole lot of lymphoid on it. It's a mixture of two cell types proliferating. This is called a benign mixed tumor. Or, or um, you know, some people will call it a pleomorphic adenoma, but it's a benign mixed tumor. So, in the olden days when I was a, a resident, we used to have what was called the 50-50 rule. And, and that meant 50% of all lesions of the lacrimal gland were, um, you know, epithelioid derived tumors and 50% of those were benign mix. Well, when people really looked at it, especially the Shields and at Wills, they looked at all of the lacrimal gland tumors that they looked at, and they turned out that 80% of them were lymphoid, either lymphoma or lymphoid hyperplasia. So the vast majority of these lesions are lymphoid. Decoradenitis, lymphoma, atypical lymphoid hyperplasia. So the 50-50 rule is half wrong, but the second half is still correct. If you have epithelial-derived tumors, from the lacrimal gland, about half of them are these benign mixed, these pleomorphic adenomas, and it's called benign mix because they are characterized by this proliferation of both the glandular elements and then kind of the support cells around them. And benign because this usually doesn't metastasize. And when you look at these, these often have this coin 
shape to them. And when you look at them grossly, when you try to remove them, although they don't have a capsule around them, they tend to slowly grow out and push the tissue adjacent to them so they get what's called a pseudocapsule. And when you remove these, instead of just doing a little biopsy, you want to try to do an excisional removal completely because these will often shell out completely. And if you can remove these totally, then you've cured it. They don't come back. The problem we run into is when people will do a small biopsy or just able to partially remove them and there's still tissue left there, and when you leave them behind, they can go bad. And so you want to try to get it all out when you can. Here's a close-up. You see you've got these glandular looking elements and then in between these connective type elements. Now, sometimes when you don't get them all out, they can go bad. And so, even though it's uncommon, you can not only get a benign mixed tumor, like a gland, but you can get a malignant mixed tumor. And it's pretty rare for these to arise just de novo, but usually it's in the setting where they've tried to remove a pleomorphic adenoma, and these guys come back like this. And so you can get a malignant mixed tumor that's a lot less common. And I know it's subtle here, but when you look at these, you've lost a lot of that glandular element to them. There's the clear line here, there's pleomorphism in here, and so you can go on and form what's called a malignant mixed tumor. And there you see a close-up of that. You see the nucleoli, and you see multiple nucleoli here, and you just see these cellular elements are a little bit more aggressive. Okay, other Chris. So external photograph the left that looks So you'd be concerned about the lacrimal gland, and then your differential diagnosis, when you see more swollen doughy like this, it still could be a tumor, but again, it could be inflammatory, it could be decreatinitis. Uh, I think lymphoma is on the list. Lymphoma on the list. Now, in this particular one, though, let's say this is the scan. You see it's still almost coin-like, although, you know, there's still a little bit of some, some edges around it, and so it's not quite that lymphoid look that you see, although it's hard to see them right here. And this is what it looks like. So it looks like uh, um, lymphocytes and a lot of connective tissue. What kind of connective tissue is this right here? It's like, it looks fairly acellular, so I want to say that Let's say a very hard connective tissue. Uh, bone. How about bone? Exactly. So this tumor is actually going into the bone. And if you look, it's got almost like a Swiss cheesy appearance to it. So what is that? What does that raise alarms for? Swiss cheese oma. Maybe like an osteoma that's invading a little bit. How about an orbital lesion that's invading the bone? So this is called an adenoid cystic. So this is, this is the bad tumor of the lacrimal gland. So adenoid cystic is a bad tumor. And the reason that, that this is really weird is usually the pathology of the tumors will tell you how aggressive they are. You, know, you look at like a sebaceous gland carcinoma, it looks really aggressive. You look at a basal cell, it looks really benign. These look disarmingly benign. You look at them, they go, oh, that doesn't look bad. And yet these could be really aggressive. And so on close-up, I apologize, it's not in good focus, but these cells do not look aggressive. They just do not look malignant. And the problem with these adenoid cystic carcinomas is they can metastasize. People die from these. And there is a particular subtype of adenoid cystic. You know, you can get a, a Swiss cheesy one, you can get ones that, that have spaces all over them, but when you start to get these, they call this the basaloid variety. And you can see it's almost like kind of like really cellular, like a basal cell would be, so they call this basaloid. These are particularly bad actors. So the adenoid cystics that go bad, this is the worst of them. And this is this basaloid variety. And these can be very nasty. As I said, these can metastasize. People can die from these. Ashley, what do we see in here? So it's a real photograph of, appears to be a
case of bruising. And again, you can see it's, it's kind of superior, but more temporal than nasal. So again, that same differential. Could this be dapriatinitis? Could it be a funny lacrimal tumor? Could it be something infiltrative? And we kind of look at a scan, and this is a scan now that's more coronal. What does this scan show you? So there's really not the fine borders of the mass. It's kind of um, interesting. You're seeing some, something that's kind of spread out and around the um, lobe and the lymphoma. So what would you be concerned about here? Lymphoma. Yeah, something lymphoid or lymphoma or decoratinitis, lymphoid hyperplasia. And so this is what Chris calls the silly putty look. You know, you've got that, instead of a distinct brown lesion, it's almost like it just kind of goes around structures and spreads around them. Not like it's fluid leaking there, but like silly putty that you put around structures. And so this would be very suspicious for a lymphoid type lesion. And indeed, so this is what, you know, lymphoma, lymphoid hyperplasia looks like. How do we tell the difference? Exactly. So flow cytometry, you'd have to do aminoperoxidase staining. And so we go ahead and we do some staining. And let's say this is a, you know, kappa B stain and they're all positive. So uh, B cell? Yeah, so B cell lymphoma. And that's by far the most common lymphoma that we see in the orbit. It's a B cell lymphoma. And it's now they call it a mantle zone lymphoma. That's the new terminology we use, but basically it's not that easy though. I mean, there, there's lymphoma here and there's, you know, dacryoadenitis or just orbital, you know, inflammatory disease here, but in between, it's not that they're so distinct. And so in between, you can get some atypical lymphoid hyperplasias and sometimes you really do have to go and do the specialized stains to tell you for sure. So you can get lymphomas and lymphoid hyperplasia both of the lacrimal gland and of the orbit in general. And so it can arise just from, from either area. Eileen, what do we see in here? Um, you see uh, choroidal folds. Okay, and what do choroidal folds usually signify? A partial vulvar mass. Okay, but what's the most common cause for choroidal folds? Hyperopia. Yeah, so hyperopia with a flat posterior eye is actually the most common, but if you're looking for lesions, this would be usually the sign of an intraconal type lesion. So you want to look for you know, malignancies of the optic nerve, but this is what the scan shows here. Let's say this person is uh, 25. Vague symptoms of fullness and pain around the eye. What about a cavernous hemangioma? Exactly. So you look at that lesion right there. It's not on the nerve. We're coming from the nerve. It's in the intracoronal area of the orbit. And does this confirm that? Yes. All right. So this is the gross specimen, and you can see it's got a pseudo capsule around and it's got these large, i.e. cavernous spaces. And so this is a cavernous hemangioma. And these behave a lot like the benign mixed tumors of the lacrimal gland in that you can shell these guys out. You know, when you get in there, once you get to the intercomal space, you can often just shell them out. They look like a little grape in there. And you just pop them out and they'll come out whole. They won't bleed, too, which is nice. And they don't have a whole lot of vascular supply. So here it is at low power microscopy and then at a higher power microscopy. So Eileen, what, what is this compared to this? Uh, red blood cells and then um, the serum. So like the red blood cells have kind of settled out at the bottom. So what does that tell you? That it's low flow. Exactly. So there's not a high flow through here. There's low flow. In fact, the red blood cells have settled down, and so this is your little hematocrit tube. So this guy's a trained athlete at high altitude. He's got a hematocrit of like 60% here. And so you see that the red blood cells settle out, and the serum sits above, and that's indicative of a low flow. And so you see they have these thin um, septae in between, and then these large vascular spaces here. And so this is a cavernous hemangioma. It usually occurs in you know, 20s, 30s, younger people, unilateral, you know, got a, you know, quasi-capsule around it. It's got some cond condensed connective tissue around it. What are we seeing here, Nico? So this is an <coughs> external photograph. Um, there's a uh, here, so that I'll show in the right eye. Um, there you are. 
would you say maybe it's more prophetic compared to the book? Yeah, book? It's, again, I hate these pictures because they show you these, the orbit guys do all the time. They say, oh, you can diagnose people by looking at them. I can't. I mean, first thing I look at is I say, what's abnormal and what's not? But if you look closely, look, there's some squirrels show here, you almost get an idea that that's just fuller on that side, that there's something behind that pushing it forward. But it's not, you know, going down now. It's probably something behind it, not necessarily something above it or temporal to it. And then this is what we see on the pathology. What do we see in here? Very dense to me. Okay. A lot of dense cells. What is this? It looks like a, a, a pack vessel or something. That, you know, when you see something like that, people call this a staghorn leech. So they look like deer antlers. You know, antlers on an animal or something. So, you know, when you're out there with your high-powered rifle that can shoot 400 yards, killing Bambi's mom, you know? Um, you know, you may see some horns on there. So this is called a staghorn lesion. And so what causes staghorn lesions of the orbit? Look real close now. This isn't just extravasated red blood cells. If you look really close, look right here and here. There's little tiny vascular channels everywhere, all around this specimen, in addition to these big staghorn spaces. Here's a close-up. Kind of these irregular staghorn spaces and a lot of cells proliferating in between. If you look, these aren't lymphatics. Those are actually plump capillary endothelial cells. Lots of them, all kinds of little Cells and then cells in between them growing. Capillary hemangioma? Yeah, but there's too much proliferation here. Capillary hemangiomas usually don't have this much cellularity to them. What lesion of the orbit has staghorn? Lymphangioma? No. Sure. Anybody? Hemangiopericytoma. So I know you guys are sick of path and we're getting down to the second or the last lecture, but this stuff's in the book. Read it. Read it the night before. Read it the morning of, whatever. I mean, this stuff's all in there. So. Does a lymphangioma also have staggered? Lymphangioma has staggered spaces, but not the cellularity. Exactly. And we're going to show you the difference in a second. But so the staghorn is our spaces? Correct? Staghorn are our vascular spaces. Yeah. They could be the lymphatic or, or blood vessels. In this case, these are vascular spaces, but if you look, they're everywhere. There's one there, there's one there, 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 there. It's almost like there are these little capillary spaces everywhere, and then spaces here, and then the cells in between are proliferating. And so it's hemangiopericytoma, proliferation of not only the blood cells, but also the pericytes. And here you can see another close-up, little staghorn space here, but if you look in between, little vascular spaces all over the place. Now, sometimes these can be more aggressive looking. And so when you look at these, they've got characteristic um, cellular findings. We will, we will call these kind of benign, intermediate, and, and more malignant looking. But what's weird about these, I don't know why the orbit's so weird, sometimes the benign looking ones can behave aggressively, sometimes the more uh, malignant looking ones can behave not quite so aggressively. So hard to predict. And so oftentimes we look and we'll say, okay, this one's more borderline or even maybe a little malignant. Look at those nucleoli, those pericytes are proliferating here. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be bad, but these are not encapsulated like a, like a cavernous hemangioma. These are tough to remove. And so when you remove these, sometimes it leaves parts behind. And over the years, they can undergo changes. And we've seen several patients here that like Rick Anderson started on 20 years ago and then Boopy's taken care of and we've seen it evolve from a benign to an intermediate to a more malignant looking hemangioparasitoma. So these could be difficult. As Boopy says, it's a real bugbear. So this could be a bugbear to get rid of because they're not really encapsulated. And there you see one that's even more malignant looking. Look at the nucleoli, the chromatin, the pleomorphism. So these can go from benign to intermediate, borderline to more malignant. What kind of stain is this? 
adjacent. Why would I show this? It does or doesn't? It doesn't. Yeah, but it is. So why is there a lot more silvery black stuff in there than your run-of-the-mill trichrome? No, it's actually not a trichrome, it's a reticular stain. <laughs> but it kind of looks like a trichrome. <laughs> so, why would we stain a, with a retic stain on, on these particular lesions? Well, okay. Well, even more than connective tissue, remember parasites are the support cells for the vessels and they really help to make the vessels stronger and not leak as much. And so what happens is when these parasites all start to proliferate, you get this reticular network from them. It almost looks like a net, you know, reticulum looks as if like net-like. And so when you look at this, if you want to do a reticulum stain, you get this net-like background staining of these. And so it kind of looks like a trichrome, but it's really not. It's a reticulum stain and it stains that reticular network that the parasites make stains it silvery black. And so this is one stain that we like to do in these particular tumors. I distinguish that from GMS stain. Uh, GMS will do a similar thing, yeah. The GMS is a silver stain in the stain, but it stains more for things like fungal walls rather than the connective tissue. But that would, you could use that here also. What's the staining specifically in the connective tissue? It's actually the, the reticulum is the little part of the parasite wall that tries to add to the vessel wall to make it stronger. So that's what it is that it's staining here. So you just do this if you're not 100% sure that that's what it is? Oh, you do it just because it's a teaching fine. institution and you want to show residents, okay. you know, things. Okay. So. Just curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I can help you if you're questioning the diagnosis sometimes, sure. All right, Lee, what do we see in here? So it's a CT scan which shows um, it looks like an extra conal along the needle aspect of the orbit. Um, doesn't look well circumscribed. It kind of looks like it's just diffuse and just kind of uh, putty-like to some degree. Um, it's not um, homogenic in terms of um, intensity. Exactly. So it's kind of heterogenic. I mean, there's some areas that are, that are you know, dark and not staining, there's some areas that are lighter and staining, and it looks like a mixture of all of them. So it's not a homogeneous lesion, it's a heterogeneous lesion. You can see it's causing a lot of proptosis. I mean, look at that. And that's some significant proptosis there. What if I tell you this patient is 12? So then you start thinking of concerns for tumor versus, um, you know, maybe some type of infectious or inflammatory process. Okay, and there's one other lesion that can give you this heterogeneous mass and you can get explosive proptosis in these. Um, cystic lesions. It can be cystic and then solid in between them. Here's that lesion. So big stack horn space, I mean. Huge oh, staghorn space. The, the most incredible yeah. staghorn space ever, <laughs> ever seen. So yeah, so this is a lymphangioma. Yeah. And when you look at lymphangiomas, they can have these big, almost like lymphatic channels, but then in between there's connective tissue. And the other thing is you can see some areas of inflammatory cells. And so these lesions can often get these little pyrus patches looking lymphocytic um, gatherings there. What's interesting with these kids is sometimes they'll get an upper respiratory infection and their proptosis will increase. And so it's thought that they can get, you know, these lymphocytes proliferate in the setting of an infection and these kids get increased proptosis. The other thing that can cause a sudden increased proptosis in these kids is this. What's happened here? So there's leading into the um, spaces. Exactly. So you can see here, there's still the classic, you know, lymphoid areas here. There's all these tiny vessels, but now you've seen bleeding into these. And so you can get an increase in proptosis when you get bleeding in these larger cystic areas of the lymphangioma. And these kids can again get an explosive proptosis. If you go in there to try to drain them, because the blood's been sitting there for a while, the red blood cells break down and it looks chocolatey. It kind of looks like chocolate syrup. So they even call these chocolate cysts because when the red blood cells break down, they start to look more brown than red and start to 
make it kind of gooey. And so these are called often sometimes chocolate cysts. Now the problem with these lymphangiomas is again they're not encapsulated. They tend to send fingers all over. So you go and you cut out part of them and then the part that's still there grows like crazy and it just comes right back. And so these are really tough to take care of. Sometimes if they get a chocolate cyst and they get this explosive proptosis, people talk about using a CT or ultrasound guided needle and you go into the cyst and try to drain them without opening them up and do surgery. Is so it usually in the setting of trauma where they bleed or just... Not necessarily. It can be under the setting of an infection or some kids, they swear nothing happened. You know, kids are always bouncing around and you know there's so. trauma or not, but um, trauma can cause it, but not necessarily. Okay. And here again is a close-up. You can see these smaller, smaller staghorn spaces, and then you see these inflammatory cells next to them. And so these are thought to be the ones that will... Um, expand and grow when you've got upper respiratory infection, so you can get increased proptosis when these kids have an infection. So what's the name of distinction between these and meningeal parasitomas? It's the cellularity. So when you look at these, you do not have that massive proliferation of the parasites. And so when you look back at the meningeal parasitoma, we'll go to a lower point. Look how cellular that is. It's just incredibly cellular. Whereas you look at these, these have these spaces that are a little bit bigger, but there's some connective tissue here, but there's not that cellular proliferation that you have in a in a heman in a um, um, hemangial pericytoma. And so, would you also say that the staghorns would be bigger? Staghorns are usually bigger in this, and so the staghorns are bigger in the lymphangiomas. All right, what do we see in here, Chris? Uh, so significant inferior and or displacement of the globe as well as proptosis and kind of fullness of that upper eyelid as well. So some sort of kind of retro bulbar uh, mass. All right. How old is this patient? Uh, young. So yeah, so say it's, this is a six-year-old. And here's the scan. Wow. Yeah, so kind of a diffuse uh, infiltrative tumor with bone erosion. <coughs> with something like that, it's get very concerned with like a rhabdomyosarcoma. Exactly. So in a kid with explosive proptosis like this and this scan, you worry about a tumor, the most you know tumor that, that fits this pattern is rhabdomyosarcoma. Now, this is a true story. This is when I was a fellow. Um, young child, they did a tiny biopsy of this kid. There was this lesion that was, you know, maybe you know less than a centimeter in size. They said, oh my God, rhabdomyosarcoma, we've got to treat the kid. And so they admitted him to primary and admitted her to primary. And the kid, they started giving chemo, and then the kid's hair started falling out. So mom and dad were divorced, by the way. So mom checked the kid out of primary and took her to Mexico. And you guys probably don't remember Laetrile. Laetrile was the miracle cancer cure. And you know that evil, you know, industrial medicine complex that keeps, you know, our kids from being cured in the U.S., you know, wouldn't let Laetrile come in. And so people would go to Mexico, and they'd get Laetrile and coffee enemas, and then magic stuff that would make them feel better. Of course they would feel better because they'd blast them with steroids. And so dad hired a private detective who traced the mom down to Mexico. Dad went to Mexico, re-kidnapped the kid, <laughs> brought the kid back up here, and now this is the kid's scan. So this is like in, in, in a matter of, of a few weeks. And so it went from a lesion, you know, this big to the whole bar, but the kid ended up having an exoneration and was, was just really a mess. But, so these tumors can grow very rapidly and explosively when you do these. All right, now, unfortunately, this was one from a Grand Rounds, and I love this. I'm going to have to, like, white out the, the, uh, the pictures here that say it. And so this doesn't actually say it on here. So what are the main classifications of rhabdomyosarcoma, the different types of them? Fleomorphic, butroid, and uh, anaplastic. All right, so what's the most common? Uh, Pleomorphic. Or embryonal. Oh, embryonal, yeah. Yeah, embryonal, embryonal, yeah. however you want to pronounce yeah. it. That's by far the most common. And so when you look at these, we just had one of these a week ago. So hopefully you've got my you know, yeah. you've got our yeah, thanks for report and all that. And so when you look at these, they'll often have kind of a round head and then kind of a thin little, little body coming out of them. But characteristically, they look like kind of tadpoles. And so they'll have a big head here and some of them will have a little tail coming out of them. But if you can if you look closely you can hallucinate cross striations. So you can see it kind of looks like a tadpole 
And then on the tail here, you've got these little cross striations. And so this is the most common type, which is called embryonal, embryonal. And this has a moderate severity to it. And so these are kind of moderately severe. They're called embryonal. And then this is in a trichrome stain. And so trichrome tends to bring out the cross striations. So you put a trichrome stain on here. Look at the little tiger stripes on here. Because these are muscle derived, not, not mature muscle, but muscle rest cells, they think. And so you can see the little cross striations on here. So this is classic for this embryonal type rhabdomyosarcoma. And there you can see a nice one, even in an H and E stain. All right, so this is one just with some special staining. And so bimentin is a stain that stains muscle cells. And so it's, a, it's an immunoperoxidase stain that stains the cytoplasm brown. And if you look right here, you can see these cells all stain brown with the bimentin stain. So you know that this is a muscle-derived tumor. All right, Becca, there's a particular subtype that's less common of uh, these rhabdos that's more aggressive and we worry about it more. I think don't remember the name of this one. Tara? Alveolar. Alveolar. Why do we call this alveolar? Um, yeah, exactly. So this kind of looks like the alveoli in the, in the lungs. And so, when you look, you see these little thin septae here, and then these cells kind of fill up in between there and line up. And so it almost looks like alveoli, you know, when you get kids that have pneumonia, and you have all the inflammatory cells in there, except here they're tumor cells. And so you look right here, you can see that the cells tend to fill these alveolar-like spaces. And this, again, doesn't look more malignant, but it is. And so this is, is at least common of the uh, rhabdomyosarcomas, but this is the most aggressive, so this is the one we really worry about. So the alveolar is the kind that we worry about. There is one called a botryoid, and there's some that are, that are even less common, and they are just really, really um, almost, um, almost like muscle. And so some people will speculate that maybe they're just more normal muscle growing than tumor. And so, but the two you want to remember is umbrinal and alveolar. And again, this just shows you an immunoperoxidase stain, staining them to show that it's muscle derived. All right, what are we seeing here, Chris? This is a photograph of a young person, left thighs, uh, have a ptosis, looks like all folded in their edema. Okay, so what would you worry about here? Um, just differential. So, a lot of things that I talked about, I think that I would add would be like a neurofibroma uh, based on the Okay, so the old saying, if you hear hoofbeats, also, so we've so just described like a unicorn and a zebra. And now, <laughs> what, what are the horses here when you hear the hoofbeats? Or cellulitis. Exactly, so cellulitis or an inflammatory condition. And that's what you'd be, those would be by far more common here than, you know, I mean, I just want to keep in the back of your mind a rhabdo or nephrobroma, but most common would be either infectious or inflammatory. So either cellulitis or, you know, normal inflammatory disease. And so when you look at this particular one, this one actually turned out to be a um, orbital inflammatory lesion. And so I just don't usually, you just don't usually get biopsies of cellulitis because you know, people just treat them and they get better. But this is one where this is the orbital inflammatory. So orbit like lacrimal glands, you know, you've got your, you know, orbital inflammatory. We used to call it pseudotumor. But tumor's a bad word, so you can't say pseudotumor. So now we call it what? Uh, Dacroadenitis. Well, if it's in the lacrimal gland, you call it dacroadenitis. If it's just in the orbit, what do we call it, actually? Orbital inflammatory syndrome. Yeah, just orbital inflammatory syndrome, orbital inflammatory disease. We used to call it pseudotumor. Again, that's a bad word. So, you know, over here you've got this orbital inflammation. Again, over here you've got lymphoma. In between, you've got some atypical import hyperplasias. And so when you look at the inflammatory type, you'll often have some um, gathering of lymphocytes here. You'll get blood vessels between them. You'll get mixtures of lymphocytes and plasma cells. You'll sometimes even get follicles. Whereas in the lymphomas, you get 
not so many blood vessels, not so many follicles, sheets of lymphocytes, and how do we tell inflammatory from lymphoma? Uh, on steroids? And actually, lymphomas can sometimes get better on steroids initially. What can a pathologist do? Yeah, exactly. So just like we talked about on the, the lacrimal gland, you can do immunoperoxidase stains, or if you get fresh tissue, you can do flow cytometry, and that'll tell you if it's clonal or not. So clonal means lymphoma, and non-clonal means lymphoid hyperplasia, or um, just an inflammatory lesion. Here you can see we've got lymphocytes, we've got plasma cells, you've got some connective tissue, some blood vessels. And here, after a while, you can even get what's called a, we used to call these fibrous pseudotumors. So you can get a fibrotic reaction from these as you try to calm the inflammation down. And these orbits can get socked in from the, from the fibrosis from these lesions. And this is more, this you can see there's more fibrous tissue in here. So you can get a significant fibrous pseudotumor, fibrous orbital inflammation if you can't calm these down rapidly. All right, what do we see in here, Ashley? So, a photograph of uh, an adult who appears to have some fierce scleral show on the left side and an increased fibrotic fissure. Um, I can see that there's a little bit of more fullness to the left lower. Fullness, but if you look here, there might even be some fullness here because it's kind of a young. I mean, I love this. It's got kind of that. 70s, you know, like porn star mustache, you know, looking good. You know. But, um, but if you look right here, he's a pretty young guy to have, like, you know, dramatochalasis. And so he's got a pretty, pretty lot of fullness, both here and here, you know, for a young guy. And we do the scans, and what do we see? So it looks like there's thickening of the recti uh, muscle bellies. And the, it looks like there's kind of obscure borders. Yeah, and even obscure, and even, you know, Chris would call it kind of a dirty fat in the orbit. So whatever's going on, there is something going on in the muscles, but it's also just in the orbit itself. And so... Potentially thyroid Well, but thyroid usually doesn't spill over like that. And so thyroid usually doesn't spill over. So this does have some inflammation in the muscles, some myositis, but it's spilling into the orbital fat now. So also... Exactly. So orbital inflammatory disease versus lymphoma, again, and if it's bilateral, you can still get a bilateral inflammatory disease, but you know, if, it, if it's bilateral, you start thinking more of lymphoma. So you can see right here, this is a diffuse sheet of lymphocytes. So you've got these moderately sized lymphocytes, some clumped chromatin. You know, I like to say when you look at the past specimens, it looks like someone took a handful of lymphocytes and just like smeared them right on the slides. So you just get this whole sheet of these lymphocytes on here. So this turned out to be a lymphoma bilateral in this in this young man. And then you do the special staining to, to stain for the clonality. Alright, now this unfortunately, um, Eileen, I didn't have a scan of this. This is the real color gross exenteration of this patient. What kind of color are we seeing in here? Um, bluish? Yeah, bluish, almost black. So kind of some, some bluish black nodular stuff all over in here. What could cause that? A melanocytic tumor. Yeah, and so what kind of melanocytic tumor would we do an exoneration for? Uh, melanoma. Melanoma. Yeah, so now. You know, when you look at the orbit, there can be different sources of tumor. You can get primary tumors of the orbit. You can get tumors from the sinuses spilling into the orbit. But you can also get metastases. And in fact, if you look, if you did a bunch of autopsies, I think probably the number one orbital tumor would be metastatic. But that's just if you did autopsies. Because once people die of their tumor, say you've got lung cancer, breast cancer, whatever, it's going to metastasize to a lot of places. And so if you did, an autopsy of people dying of cancer, you'd probably find that orbital metastases from elsewhere would be the most common cause. But you can get tumors that arise from the eyelids, that arise from the sinuses, move into the orbit. So this happens to be 
a patient who initially had a conj melanoma, but then kept coming back and they couldn't treat it, and so it ended up being an orbital melanoma, and, and they had to do an exaneration. At this point, it's just housekeeping. And once it's, once it's gotten that far, it's going to metastasize elsewhere, and so you just can't have this tumor growing in the orbit, and so they did an exaneration there. And when we look at it, this turned out to be malignant melanoma. And I know you can't tell these are melanoma cells on here, I'm sorry, but it's these plump um, cells right here with just a little bit of pigmentation on them, and they're going into the orbital fat. So you can get tumors arising from the lid going into the orbit, and that can be squamous cell carcinomas, it can be melanomas, it can even be sebaceous carcinomas. And here's a close-up of those ugly-looking melanoma cells. Nico, what are we seeing here? So this is an external photograph of maybe an elderly person. You see a lot of uh, proptosis in both eyes, um, severe and inferior sclerosis show both eyes, lid retraction, and some uh, injection. So this is Becca when I asked her the last question? No? And this is, uh, uh, sorry, likely thyroid disease. Yeah, so this looks like that. So when you have that surprise look, people give you that surprise look, that often is, is thyroid is in the differential. And so what's the most common cause of bilateral proptosis in an adult? Thyroid. What's the most common cause of unilateral proptosis in an adult? Thyroid. Thyroid disease. So you guys do listen sometimes. So that's good. So you can see right here, not only do you have this scleral show superiorly and inferiorly, but you get this little um, injection of the, of the blood vessels here, especially around the recti. You see that real commonly in thyroid eye disease also. And here you can see this is the scan, and here you see it's not spilling over into the orbit, it's just in the muscles. And what's the difference in the, the involvement of the muscles in thyroid versus myositis? In thyroid. So thyroid spares the tendon. So see how the tendon is thin? So you see that the belly of the muscle is fat, but the tendon is spared. Whereas in myositis, it can go all the way up to where it inserts in the eye. Now, would you be worried about this particular patient with this scan? Uh, yes. Why? Uh, there's a lot of uh, thickening of the muscles, like in the, in the back, so I'm concerned for uh, um, optic nerve. Exactly. So look at these fat muscle bellies going all the way back to where the optic nerve comes out at the apex of the orbit. So when you see that congestion posteriorly like that, you really worry about it because you can get optic neuropathy secondary. So now obviously when the patient's really proptotic and the lids are really retracted, you can get exposure and all kinds of other problems. But these are the ones you really worry about when they're posterior. This is one I copied out of the book. This is an autopsy. <coughs> Look at that muscle belly, how big it is, but look at how the tendon is spared. So that shows it nicely in this autopsy eye. And when you look at these, they'll have this diffuse infiltrate, lymphocytes, some plasma cells, and then this kind of an edematous mixoid stuff. Now eventually, when you, this burns out, you can even get fibrosis of those muscles. So those muscles get fibrotic and shortened. People will get diplopia from the thyroid disease. All right, boy, this, um, this is a specimen, Jason, that you saw in the, in the clinic, in, I mean, in the um, path lab, and you grossed this in. This was actually removed from the orbit, and we're trying to shine a light through it. What are we trying to show there? I'm trying to show a tumor area of darkening. Actually, one. It, it doesn't show up well, and so we're, trying to show, we're actually showing how it kind of lights up when you when you do the light. Okay, so, so it's cystic. cystic. So it's cystic. So what's a big cystic lesion that you'd be concerned about in the orbit? Uh, any younger patient would be concerned about a dermoid cyst. Okay. And indeed, this was a five-year-old. So we open it up, and this is it grossly, and it's got all of this <coughs> disgusting cheese inside. It's like caseating. So what would this be? Well, Joe, just what you said. I mean, it's, it's, it's a dermoid. Now, how do we tell a dermoid pathologically? Um, you need to see um, some epidermal features like uh, epithelium, stratified epithelium. Okay. And what else do you need beside the epidermal features? Then you need some dermal appendages as well. So exactly. 
So when you have a dermoid cyst of the orbit, now it's different from the, you know, the, the dermal core stomas of the limbus. These are cystic structures, and you've got this epithelial lining, just like skin, but you've also got hair and sebaceous glands and sweat glands. And so you have dermal appendages along with this. And when you look at it, and, and again, this is a fellow's picture here. I should be, see, I always, if they're blurry, you blame the fellows. You know? So I do the same thing when I show videos at the meetings. If it's like a disaster, I say, of course, the resident's doing this case. And if it looks great, I say, this is my case. So. But the fellow obviously took this. So you see this stratified squamous epithelium. The cyst is filled with keratin. But look down here. There's a hair follicle. There's a sebaceous gland. So you've got epithelium, but also dermal appendages in these. And so people theorize that there may be surface ectoderm, sometimes in embryology, that gets pinched off. Because it's often located along where the sutures between the bones are. So they think that maybe a piece of this gets pinched off and then it just grows throughout the kid's life and it eventually causes problems. So when you remove these, you try to remove them whole because if you spill keratin in an orbit, keratin can cause a lot of inflammation. But sometimes these will spontaneously rupture and then the keratin will spill out and they get lots and lots of inflammation. Okay, we say bye to the Snake River. So next week is tumors. But also in terms of tumors, we're going to talk about leukocoria in kids. So know your leukocoria differential diagnosis. Questions? For that last case, uh -huh. um, how would you tell that if you're just looking at the gross specimen um, that it wasn't like fat? Oh, you, you can't tell. You can't tell. It does look fatty. And it looks like it's just fatty lesion. But the difference is it's not solid, when you put a light next to it, the light kind of transilluminates through it so you know it's cystic. And it's rare for a cystic structure to be totally filled with fat. So when you cut it, it's, it's keratin is really disgusting. When you cut it, keratin is just, it's cheesy and it smells and it's really pretty, pretty yucky.